We get some horses that do this, they twist. You notice they don't twist on the first part of their stride. They twist when they go past center. So it's not that the heels they're twisting on, it's the toe they're twisting on. And we're, we're always focused on what we're gonna do to the heels to stop them twisting. But it's actually the toe they're twisting on. And you find most of those horses, they'll have a long distance from the fetlock to the point of their toe. So what you've got is as it's going past center, it's, it's a fulcrum point like that. And if you can decrease that fulcrum point, as it goes past the toe, it'll stop twisting. I'm not saying you don't have to do something to the heels, but the first part is to change the toe. And so when you look at this guy, there's a bit of twist in it. And I think it's not just the heels that need addressing, it's something needs doing to the toe. If you want to look at a lady in a pair of high heel shoes, you'll see them, they, they always twist because the stilettos are always pointy, okay? And they're, they're, they're twisting on that excess length of toe because they ain't got feet that shape. I'm gonna do the same thing with this one. It's the same guidelines, okay, with this as it is with the front foot drawing the lines. It's not different guidelines, okay? So I'm just gonna clean off the loose sole just so it speeds us up a bit. We'll look down that again. And one of the things I see why feet go like this is people lean their nippers out, okay? When they use their nippers, they tend to pick up the foot like that, they end up with their nippers over this way. So the foot's gonna lean that way, isn't it? On this side of the foot, the, ins the outside edge of the wall is gonna be higher than the inside edge of the wall. By the time you get around here, the inside edge is lower than the outside, or higher than the outside. And it's how we use our tools, is quite often what we're doing. But I draw the same lines on a hind foot, it's the same. And we'll see right now, we've probably got about 60% in front. Now, I will use a roll toe in front and not behind. So I feel like a front foot wants to roll over. I'm much more likely to use a setback shoe behind with a sharp edge because the hind foot has to dig in and propel the horse. So what you do to front isn't necessarily exactly what you do to the hind in the, sh in the, sh in the shoe part of it. Somewhere around here is the widest point of the frog. Here's the end of the heels. Draw a line forward forward. Somewhere there you'd be punching your toenails on the inside edge of the white line. Here's your widest point of the foot I would say somewhere there would you say? Draw a line from the toenail across the end of the heel. And you can see it crosses over that area yet again. That's a hind foot. That, that's what gives me a good idea where it's going to be. Widest point of the foot, end of the heel, forward to the white line, forward to the white line, cross, 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 and that's fairly close. First thing I've got to do is to try and get this look a bit more perpendicular. So I'm going to start here. And as I come around here, I'm tipping my nippers slightly to the inside. See, I'm slipping up. Tipping over slightly. And that's shortening the outside edge of the wall more than the inside. Let's have a look at that foot now. And if you look at the foot from behind, it probably looks a lot squarer with the leg. Put them down. If you look at it from the front, it does. It doesn't look like it's tipped over, I believe. I mean, I haven't looked at it, but what I expect is the foot to be much more square. If you look at it now, the whole foot is much more even to the coronary band and to the line of the leg from the front. And I haven't done any dressing. You know, it's not because I've rasped the outside to change it. It's just changing the plane. I don't think we'll have to by the time we get finished, truthfully. I, 
I would if I had to, but I don't think, I mean, I'll be able to do it with width of material, I think. And I'm going to take the outside down a little bit. It's, can you see how it's crushing? And why has it been crushing? Well, if you come inside a vertical, where's your weight going when you put weight on it? It's been bearing more weight. So that's why it's crushed. And if you don't take away the crushed, the unhealthy, it's just going to continue crushing. See, I'm going to dress a bit off this toe. Can you, can you see how it's been pull, pulled in this direction to the outside? So I'm going to control that. Because I'm still going to have enough to nail to with that distorted white line. So I'm not just rasping it away. Can you see that line there? So everything outside that belongs to me. So it's not that I'm, I'm not dressing the foot off without a plan. I'm dressing it back to that point right there. That's where I've shaped my foot up to. If we think of something, that, a gross distortion, what about a horse with a sheared heel? If you want to fix, the, if you look at a horse with a sheared heel walk, he'll land perfectly flat, won't he? Doesn't mean the foot's balanced. They're landing perfectly flat. You've got to trim that foot unflat, float the one heel to get it to come down. That's bringing it back into balance. But you might have to do that every time you have a horse with a sheared heel. Because he's been sheared for a long time, you find every time you trim him, because he's got that memory, because the foot's been loading more on the, let's say, inside, because it's been loading more and it's been higher, you get more circulation. So even if you cut it down today, when you come back in four weeks, it's still going to grow more because you've had more circulation there. And you find with some of those horses, it, it's something that you, you never stop on. So I want the horse to be able to land flat, okay, land flat. So I can't thin the branch to make it wider. So I've got to pull the material to the side. As long as it's full thickness in the middle, it doesn't matter if it's thin on the inside. And think about it when it gets onto a soft surface. If this is wider and this is narrower, when that goes on a, flat, on a soft surface, this side's going to load up, isn't it? It's going to prevent that from sinking in. If you watch him walk right now, he's got this tendency to sink on the outside heel. When he gets into a soft surface, if he's got a narrow shoe on it, then it's going to sink in even more when he puts weight in it. So if we've got a shoe with a wide branch and a narrow branch, when he goes onto a soft surface, if you put equal weight on it, the, inside, the narrow branch will sink in a little bit. And that's what I want with this guy. Because the way he's conformed, he always pushes more weight into his outside heel. So I'm going to try and make this outside heel wider without making it thinner. What I'll do, I'll pull the inside edge down this way, and I'll pull the outside edge down. But I'll leave the, the middle of it thick, normal thickness. So when he walks on the concrete, he can land flat. When he gets onto a soft surface, because this is wide, it will gather more support. And that's where you'll see some of the guys in Europe, they'll also then concave the inside branch. Not make it thinner, concave it. Because if I make this concave, I take away the surface area. So when it lands on the surface, this will sink in, this will be supported. So you'll see a lot of people shoeing with really big, wide lateral supports. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to increase the web width. And if you increase web width and decrease web width, you can have the same effect without the gross extensions. Okay, because it's what's happening on the surface. And you can try that on sand yourself. Just take some sand, wet it, put it flat, put a shoe on it, press down on it, see what happens. Make one side really wide, one side really narrow, look what happens. So it doesn't have to be just a big, great big lateral extension. It can be done with, you know, just changing web width on a normal shoe. And again, what I'll do just for today, I'm going to decrease the web width on the inside. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to cut out the inside edge. I'm not going to change the width of the foot surface because I want the foot to be on the shoe properly. I'm going to decrease the amount of ground surface. Not in thickness, 
but in physical area. Separate this a bit. I'm going to take away a bit of the inside, okay? And just to show you how easy it is, that it's something that anybody can do. What you should have is a cutting block to go on your anvil, a little piece of aluminum plate, so you don't end up damaging the anvil. Okay, that would, that's the idea. It doesn't damage your tool or the anvil. But I'll just cut this out, just to show what, you know, it, it, these are the things you can do as a keg sure. You know, you don't have to go and make handmaids. You know, is it appropriate? Yes, you can do it with keg shoes. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if, and you can do it quickly. You know, you could, you, you could do a pair of these in 10 minutes if you're working a pair and swapping back and forth. Yeah, we did. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, I've cut the inside edge of my shoe off. And if you look, I haven't changed the web width at all. It's purely I've changed the ground surface. Take away the sharpness. Yeah, pull the, pull the inside edge down. Look how much we've changed those two branches in, in, in surface area, significantly. And you find this quite handy, this widen the web and you get these curly around heels like this and you want to fit to the coronary band and you want to fit the foot because it curls in and if you fit the foot you haven't got enough material and if you leave the shoe out there you haven't got enough you're not supporting the foot the foot's falling through the shoe so it's a technique you can use for that right now if you looked we had a lot of flare to the inside because that was very long on the inside well if you were long on one side that means if you're trying to flare the inside it's got to be a reaction, it's got to get more contracted on the outside. So because we've taken away the reason for the flaring on the inside, it, it won't encourage that heel to keep contracting, so it should improve. You want a bit of hammer control there, because you don't want to kill your nail holes. What I really should check right now is the width of the foot because it'll help me with my fitting. I'll end up taking less trips. And if I check the width of the foot, and let's give some guidelines. If I check the width of the foot and the toenail and the heel line up and the toenail and the heel line up and the shoe's the right width, it should fit pretty much first time, shouldn't it? Because I've drawn the lines on there and the toenail and the heel line up. And if it's right width, it should go somewhere near. My normal process when I was shooting with machine maids, I, 
on horses I shod regularly, okay, for efficiency, but horses I shod regularly that I knew the feet, they were pretty much a pair. I trimmed the left front, left hind, I put the fronts in the fire. When I finished trimming the right front and the right hind, the fronts would be hot. I could clip them up and fit them, but as soon as I started working on the fronts, I'd put the hinds in the other side of the fire. So as I finished fitting the fronts, the hinds were ready. I don't like wasting time. I don't like being fast, but I don't like wasting time. Come on, hurry up. I do. <laughs> uh, behind it's all it's all side clips. In front it's a mixture 50-50. And you can feel the fit there. I haven't got any foot to cheat. I've set back the toe about half the thickness of the wall. I set all my hinds back a little bit. Purely, just, I can round the edge up just in case they overreach. And it eases the break over. Because what it does, it decreases. By setting it back that little bit, it decreases the, the surface area there, doesn't it? Okay, so I'll set it back and it decreases the surface area. And you can see what I mean about the okay. guideline. Okay, and I think we need lots of guidelines, not rules, but guideline. What I would typically do is set the shoe back half the thickness of the wall. I like them set back, but I don't like them set back every time to the white line. And what you find happens with some horses, if they don't have support at the toe, you find you'll see the coronary bands like sink down. You'll see the coronary bands sink down at the toe. But if you only set them back half the thickness of the wall, then the wall is the toe is being supported. Okay, so I believe in setting back about half the thickness of the, the wall. I just round the edge off. No, I don't want to weaken the foot either. What I look at is, have we made a 70% improvement? Then, I, then I'm happy. You know, I'm not looking for 100%. I'm looking for a good compromise. It, it didn't, it, whatever you look at probably didn't go wrong in one shoeing. Why should you expect to fix it in one shoeing?